who's me Lord for your service draw me nearer every day I'm willing I'm willing to run on all the way if I falter while I'm trying, Lord, don't be angry. Just let me stay. Cause I'm willing, I'm willing to run on. Oh. Good morning. Welcome to Salem Missionary Baptist Church, our virtual service. My hope, my prayer that God has blessed you this week and kept you. We thank God for his continued uh, protection and provision for all of those in the body of Christ and our members here at Salem Missionary Baptist Church. We will now have our scripture reading. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be from the Gospel of John. We're we'll reading chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, and I'm using the King James Version of our Bible. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I read from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Lord, it's in you. Oh, Lord, I'm trusting. Lord, it's in you. Lord, I'm trusting. Lord, it's in you. Lord, I'm trusting. I'm trusting, I'm trusting in you, Lord, to see me. Through. Oh, the road may be rough, Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm trusting. The road may be rough, Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm trusting. And the going may get tough. Lord, I'm trusting. I'm trusting in you, Lord. 
trusting. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you. Lord. Yes, I am. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you. Heavenly Father, in profession our faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're so thankful that we're able to come before you this morning, dear Lord, in humbleness and, and gentleness, dear Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that this service may be done according to thy Holy Spirit, dear Heavenly Father. We just ask for your continuing guidance, dear Lord, as we go through these turbulent times, dear Lord. But we know that you are still on the throne, dear Heavenly Father. And all things are in your hands, dear Heavenly Father. We ask, dear Lord, that you continue to bless this church, not only this church, O oh Lord, but all of thy churches, where well, there's citron, every nation, kindred, and tongue, dear Heavenly Father. And Lord, we also pray for the sick among us, dear Lord, that they may be able to come back once again and worship with, thy, with their brothers and their sisters, dear Heavenly Father. We ask that you continue to bless this ministry, dear Lord, and continue to guide Pastor Williams and his uh, devotion unto you, dear Heavenly Father. We just ask all of this, Lord, knowing that we're not worthy, but only by your mercy and your grace that you have bestowed upon us to our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, a high priest in heaven. Amen.
do me like Jesus. Nobody do me like the Lord. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh, gracious God, our Father, we come this morning, Father, to ask for forgiveness. We come asking that you would forgive us of our sins, our sins of omission, our sins of commission. We thank you and praise you, Father, for health, for strength, your mercy, and your grace. O oh, gracious God, so loving kindness and tender mercies shown toward each of us. So, Father God, you've been better than good. We ask, Lord, that I would decrease and that you would increase, that your word would go forth and touch whom you desire. Touch me and not return void or empty, but that your word would prosper there and where you would send it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen, amen. Well, we praise God uh, once again on this um, May 17, 2020, the third Sunday in May. I trust all of you uh, have been encouraged and, and that you continue just to, to lean on God. Uh, our theme for the rest of this month will be, Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. But for a subject, I want to use... Spiritual bankruptcy. Spiritual bankruptcy. Let's define that uh, spiritual bankruptcy. That a state of complete lack of some abstract property that you just feel that you just spiritually just empty or drain. Uh, for example, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven, uh, when your, as we could say, when your heart is at its its lowest, its lowest point, that would be considered as spiritual bankruptcy. But let's go a little further, and I think you will be encouraged. He says, "And the one that can turn it all around when you feel that you're at your lowest, when you can't go any further, is God." He's the one through Jesus Christ. You feel that I'm, I'm empty and I'm at a loss, so what do I do next? There is someone that can step in and make the difference. It's God the Father through Jesus. But then it gets better. The disciples were, were completely bewildered. Uh, they were concerned that uh, Jesus had said that he was going away. And he had been with them for three years, that he had, uh, he had raised the dead, and he had healed the sick, he had fed the hungry. And, and I want you just to kind of work with chapter 14, uh, looking at verses 1 through 6. I'm always encouraged uh, by this chapter. I know quite often we do use this particular uh, passage at a home going. But I believe it's, it's living and, and speaks to when you feel that all is lost and then God comes along and offers uh, some relief. I offer the relief. So if you feel bewildered, bewildered as the disciples did, confused and puzzled and, and discouraged. Uh, in the study there, are six points I want to kind of just bring out. Uh, the Jesus that he had said he was going away is a reference, chapter 7, verse 34. Uh, number two, that he was going to die. So he's leaving, he's going to die. Uh, not such great news to hear, right? That one of the twelve was a traitor, that Peter was going to disown him that Satan was at work against all of them, and all the disciples would fall away. This is after over three years of walking with him 
And then Jesus shares this news with them that, in truth, we would probably say was quite discouraging. And we'd be honest, you know, you, along the way, we've been in relationships with people, and then we find the person saying, you know what, I'm going to have to leave. Uh, I'm going to have to take my leave. Just, just not a warm and fuzzy kind of feeling, but with all of that, we come to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 1. Seems that Jesus immediately gives them some relief. He says, what? Let not your heart be troubled. Hmm. After sharing all that was, was going to happen, he said, let not your, your heart be troubled. What, what does that really mean? He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, be troubled. Hmm? Don't you allow it to happen. That you somehow within us that God gives us the ability to have peace in the middle of trouble. So we don't allow that to happen. The study goes further as we translate trouble. And what, what does that really mean? The trouble is translated stirred up or agitated. Essentially, don't be afraid. Many would potentially say, well, Reverend Williams, you know, all of that sounds good, especially in light of what we are faced with today with this pandemic. Don't be afraid. Don't allow our hearts to be troubled. Don't allow ourselves to go through a lot of trepidation. But the study goes further, and I believe brings some consolation and some care when he says one's heart is the center of his, of his or her personality. Consider this. Each believer is responsible for the condition of their own heart. And quickly, people say, oh, no, God is. No, God is. God overall, but we have a responsibility ourselves. But really, while we look at situations and circumstances from a position, uh, from our own spiritual posture, how do you see it? There's a reference of Proverbs 3, uh, 1, 3, and 5. And perhaps to, to encourage a little more, it says, by a firm trust in God the Father and Jesus the Son, they, uh, we could relieve their soul sorrow and be sustained in the coming test. That as many as we go through this trial, this test of what we're looking at today, that we have to, in truth, encourage ourselves. Does that make sense? Um, I, I, I think it does. I, I, I believe it does. That each day, as you say, well, I have a trust in God, that I'm holding on to him. And if we're holding on to God and we're trusting in him, then we need to do what? We need to act like that. We need to act that way. Why? Why is that so important? Because somebody else is looking at you, perhaps in your own home. Somebody's looking at you, believer, you that we're going to church every Sunday. You that talk about God and how he has protected and provided for you. He says, what if ye believe in God? This is Jesus. He said, then do what? Believe also in me. He said, if you believe in the Father, then believe also in me. For this firm trust in God, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, they could relieve their soul sorrow and be sustained in the coming test. But it goes further. It says if, if, you, if you can just hold on to that and where you just trust in God, because it's believing in God, believe also in me, really speak to, speaks to trusting in God. If you trust in him, then Jesus is saying, trust also in me. Does that make sense? But in the darkest hour, we believe that, that, that the, the purpose of, 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 of our love for God and our trusting in him, it helps us. Well, the unbeliever does not have that kind of cushion. Does that make sense? That kind of, hmm, someone to come alongside, the paraclete, which is the God, the Holy Spirit, as he comes alongside to comfort us, Comfort us through what, Reverend Williams? Comfort us through those dark times. Ah, in the darkest of times that we can still see a glimmer of light. Does that make sense? That's good anyhow, huh? But it gets just a little better. Let's move 
Jesus gives them some reassurance. He says what he says, in my Father's house, always giving deference to the Father, always turning the light off of him back to the Father. In my Father's house are many mansions. Then he gives a conditional word, if. If it were not so, I would have told you. This is the part that I just love. He says, what? I go to prepare a place for you. Wherever you are, you're sitting, you're listening to this, that should have caused you to say at least one amen. That he says, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to, to prepare that place for you. And essentially, until he gets back, then we can continually come to him before he comes back. Does that make sense? The psalm would say when we was all of that sounds nice, and, 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 and I guess it's somewhat encouraging. But I, I want us to, to consider that what Jesus was attempting to do was to give them a modicum of peace, just a small amount of peace to trust in him, to, uh, to let them know that death should not be a terror to them because Jesus was leaving to prepare a place for them in heaven in his father's house. That he's not just leaving, not just dying without a purpose, but he's going to do something for them. Does that make sense? But it gets just a little better. Let's move a little. We come to three and he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, he says what? I will do what? I will come again. That's good stuff, isn't it? And receive you unto myself, that where what I am, there ye may be what? Also. And say, I'm going, but I'm going to come back. You know, I, I, oftentimes I say this, there are people that have made a lot of promises to us. And we've made a lot of promises to people. And truth, we'd be honest, we didn't always keep them. But I, I, I live with this attitude that the one who is able to keep his promise is Jesus the Christ. The one that doesn't just arbitrarily tell you he's going to do something, but he stands behind his word. He said, I'm coming back. He's coming back. Instead, he says, I will come again that the, the rapture of the church when he comes in the cloud. Rapture is simply just translated caught up. And they say, the scripture says, and the and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we'll be caught up in the air with him. Then when, when Christ uh, will return for his, for his sheep. There's a reference to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, 13 through 18. And then he says, and they will be with him. If we, if we could just imagine that Jesus had walked over three years with these disciples. In truth, he was their shepherd, he was their master, he was their teacher. Some called him Rabboni, but in truth, he was their protector. He was the one that kept those two-legged wolves off of them many times. Uh, he spoke when they were going to act out of being anxious or, or angry, and he stopped them. And now he says he's leaving. Some are struggling even with what we're challenged with, saying, well, look, where is God in all of this? And why has God allowed this to happen? And as I say on a regular basis, God is seated on his throne, same place he has been for all of eternity. He doesn't have to come to make something happen. But for each of us, that the God that lives inside of us gives us that peace when he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that what, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus is saying wherever he is, that those of us who have accepted him as Savior and Lord, that he has chosen before the foundation of the world, will be able to live with him. How long? For all of eternity. But it gets just a little better. Let's move a little, 
literally come to verse 4, he says, And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know, Jesus is saying, I've told you this, I've rehearsed it to you over and over again. Hmm. He shared with them, being with the Father is sufficient, and, 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 and Jesus told them, you know the way to the place where I'm going. You know I told you that I'm leaving. And oddly enough, when we consider the times and truth in our prayers that God tells us it is going to be all right. At times that little small voice down on the inside of your spirit says, don't worry. Or well, scripture which says, be anxious for nothing. But everything through prayer and supplication, let your petitions or your requests be known. That's book, that's Bible. So that means that you or I, when we're faced with a test, we do not need to start pulling our hair out saying, how is it going to go? But engage God. Surrender more. Father God, I'm not getting the answers. I'm, I'm concerned. Talked about this before, about considering pushing aside some food and praying to God. So the side, the television and talk to God. So decide sometime on an everyday basis. First, when he opens your eyes and you know that you're still in the world, that you can say what? Thank you, Jesus, for giving me another day. Start right there. There's something about that peace, that unquestionable peace, that God is going to take care of things. Amen. But I guess just a little better, let's move a little we come to verse 5. There's always somebody that doubts, though. There's always someone that is concerned or, or extremely concerned. And in truth, more of us are concerned than we actually will speak out. But in verse 5, we find one of the disciples doing just that. We call him Brother Thomas. Uh, uh, Doubting Thomas is one of the monikers that's put to his name. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. Yes, the question, and how can, how can we know the way? The study just simply says that Thomas simply reflected the perplexity of the eleven. They were all struggling. They didn't all have the nerve to say, you know what, we're a little unsure. And yet Thomas speaks. Uh, they would remain puzzled with his death and resurrection, and until the advent of the Holy Spirit, they were still, mm, I know he told us. I know he told us he was going. I know he told us that he would come back. I know he told us that he would tear the temple down and he would rebuild it in three days. But there's something about this side. With all that we know, there's, there's still a struggle with death on this side. It's so final on this side. And so we, we be honest, even in our world today, that we struggle with that. Say, well, I have a peace, Rev. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And that's good if you do. But we all come to that place where loved ones pass before us. And, and in truth, that concern sometimes turns to, to fear. I guess the best remedy for that is to really call on God and say, Father God, I, I need that same grace, Lord, that you would allow me to tap into that, Father, that you've given me, Lord, at the point that I was saved. You, so you give all of us a reasonable portion, uh, Lord, of faith, and, and I need to be able to, hmm, to live in that. To live in that and trust you. Lord, not my will, but thy will so that I'm not puzzled at all about it. Lord, that, that you had given us the information and that you, you I, I believe you, I believe your word. You have kept me thus far. Father, you've protected my family. We think about us today, how God has kept us, our families. He's kept our loved ones. He's, he's kept our homes. He's kept our, our, our employment. He's kept these bodies. I've said this before, and I hope I'm not repeating myself, 
but when we sleep that the heart and the lungs are involuntary muscles. You don't need to be awake and think that for those to function that God has set in place. And so if God's up all night, why should you or I be up all night walking up and down the halls saying, Lord, how is this going to work out? How am I going to work with it? How am I going to get through? Or tossing and turning in your bed. You can't rest. You can't sleep. You're up and down. I have an old saying, and, and I've held this for many years. If you're going to pray, don't worry. But if you just enjoy worrying, don't bother God with it. That seems kind of simple, huh? If you're going to pray, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't continue to entertain it. So I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. So he tries to remind you that you need whatever you need. You need more money. Or you need more love. Or you need the love of your children, the love of your parents. You have a problem on the job. That you don't have to just continue to just entertain it. That I'm going to lift that to the Lord. Does that make sense? But it gets better because the question when he says, he said, how can we know the way? And we come to verse 6. He says, Jesus saith unto him, and this is real simple. He says, I am the way. So embodied in Jesus Christ is the way. Does that make sense? He says, I'm the way. And then he says something else. I am the truth. Why is that significant? Because if we be honest, along the way, people have told us a lot of lies. They said, come with me and you'll know the truth. Come with me, I wouldn't mislead you. And we've been misled. And we'd be honest, along the way, we probably have misled some people. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hmm. Then he says, no man. This is a struggle for some because they figure they're all kind of ways into heaven. But the word says, no man comes unto the Father, but by me, that we, we've got to go through Jesus Christ. That Jesus' words, I am the way and the truth and the life, are the sixth of Jesus' seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. Here's a question. Why is Jesus the way? That's one perhaps for you in your own home to consider. Why is he the way? Here's the answer. Jesus is the way because he is the truth and the life. He's the way because he's the truth and the life. I say this, self, self, say this to myself uh, on a regular basis. Now, that in truth it is in him in Jesus Christ that I live. It is in him that I move. It is in him that I have my being. You know, along the way, I'm in my early 60s now, and along the way, some of my loved ones and friends have died younger, and even my age. Some things have taken, I get calls from, from Texas at different places tell me someone has passed away that's, that's my age. And so Satan, who is the master of deception, will whisper in your ear, one of his demons will whisper, your turn is coming. And amazing, I already know that. My thought is I need to work while it is day. Do what I can do, and that's what I would suggest to you. Do what you can do while you can, because night surely coming. Each day, we thank God for that day. And that model prayer says, give us this day our daily bread, that daily substance of what we need daily, and let that stand on its own. There's enough evil in one day to take care of that instead of worrying about tomorrow. So if we, we go back to that verse 1 when he says, Let not your heart be troubled. 
essentially saying you, you the individual, you and your home, wherever you are looking at this me, do not allow my heart to be troubled or agitated because I believe in God. I believe in God. It means I trust God. That I believe in Jesus. I trust him. And God, the Holy Spirit, has come alongside to comfort, to strengthen, and even to remind us that we are taken care of, that we are protected and provided for, and in due season, we will reap if we faint not. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Oh, gracious God, I come to say thank you and praise you, Father. Mm, gracious God, you've been better than good. Lord, with all that has taken place and all that you have allowed your disciples to know and for us, it's 2,000 years later, Lord, to see in your word. Lord, to be honest, we are still troubled and concerned. And so, Father, we, we come with a message like this to let us know, Father, that you are in control. And, and through this season that we would be just uplifted and just encouraged and thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Oh, gracious God, if there's anyone, wherever they are in their homes, that have never accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, that the doors of the church are open in your home. You have the ability to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. Savior, that he would save you from hell and damnation, which is a literal place, and that he's Lord of your life, Lord of your decisions, Lord of your choices, Lord, we are real grateful that you've given that opportunity. And then if you do not have a church home, a place where you can be encouraged and compassion can be shown toward you and your family, Salem Missionary Baptist Church is a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Holy Spirit-led church. If you have a church home in another city, you can still join with us under Watch Care Christian Experience. You will be able to see our phone numbers on the screen, our address. Reach out to us. We'll be so happy to lead you to Christ, to welcome you into this body of believers at Salem Missionary Baptist Church. And if you just need prayer, if you need prayer, you're more than welcome to call us. We're so happy to pray with you, believe God with and for you. We've done as commanded, O oh gracious God, and yet there is room. We thank you and praise you for the privilege in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Here at Salem Missionary Baptist Church, we believe in tithing. We believe in, in, in giving, giving of your time, giving of your talents, giving of your treasure. And Father, you've been better than good to us. We hold fast to Malachi chapter 3. And the question is asked, uh, where have you, we robbed you? The disciples asked Jesus, he said, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. We just hold fast and believe that we give that 10% in an offering and, and that God can do more with that 10% than we could do if we would keep the entire hundred. Because in truth, it all belongs to God. And in, as I say on a regular basis, it's really not about money but it is about obedience, willing to give that which he has instructed back to his work. He takes care of our families. He takes care of our homes. He keeps our health, keeps our loved ones. He gives us the desires of our heart. I want to be in, in obedience. I've seen God work. I cannot say that it is easy to do it, but by faith. Faith is what the substance of things hope for and the evidence of things that are not yet seen. I'd like to thank God for the offering. We thank you, Father, for those that continually to give. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for those that would mail their, their tithes, their offerings in, those that drop by and drop it in the mailbox to bring those offerings to me on a Sunday, Lord, in which we're able to get those safely put away, are able to give online. 
we thank you, Father God, for giving us these different venues where our people can continue to worship. We thank God and praise him for the service, something that I would normally do in our service the first Sunday of every month, and I have completely forgot, and that is to wish everybody born in a particular month happy birthday. So I want to say happy birthday to all of those that were born in May, to those that we missed in April, uh, happy birthday. And it is a blessing for all birthdays this side of the grave. This now ends our service. May we bow word of prayer. Oh, gracious God, I thank you and praise you for all that you've done. Lord, uh, we ask, Father, that this week be a promising week, a protected week. We ask, Father, that you would provide for each of us, our families. We desire your very presence in our day-to-day -day walk. And Lord, you, you've, uh, you've kept us, Lord, in, in spite of how it looks. And Father, we continue, oh, gracious God, to lift all those families that loved ones have transitioned uh, during this pandemic from this virus. And Lord, we truly, we love you so much. And we thank you for all the love you shared towards each of us. Wherever you are, may we all repeat together, may the grace of our Lord and his sweet communion, may it rest and rule and abide with us, henceforth and forevermore. And they all said, Amen. Till we walk the streets of gold.